This is the sweet sound of success with Sue Wilhite, Profit Attraction Master. Marjorie Wildcraft is the founder of the Grow Network, which is a movement of people who are stopping the destruction of the earth via homegrown food. National Geographic featured Marjorie as the expert in off-grid living. She's hosted Mother Earth News Online Homesteading Summit, and she is listed in Who's Who in America for having inspired hundreds of thousands of backyard gardens. She is the focus of Reuter's award-winning article on food sustainability. And welcome, Marjorie. Oh, boy. <laughs> wow, I'm impressed by that. <laughs> Don't you love this it when somebody a- reads your bio and you go, wow, really? <laughs> no, I still clean out the chicken coop, okay? It's, <laughs> you know. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'm excited. To have you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is this is going to be great. This is going to be so much fun because you you have an interesting life. So, um, for my first time viewers, the subtitle of the show is "The Hero's Journey for the Entrepreneur's Soul," and the format is that we're going to be talking about Marjorie's ordinary beginning, uh, her call to action as an entrepreneur, the big hairy monsters that she got to play with along the way and (laughs) dance with. And (laughs) hmm, there's some underground planting and composting perhaps. (laughs) Um, And one of two actually of the most important things that I think uh, in the entrepreneur's journey One is the allies, the guides, the mentors, the sidekicks, the helpers along the way, because none of us as entrepreneurs have done this by ourselves. And what Joseph Campbell calls the journey home, which in our context is how do people who aren't aren't entrepreneurs deal with entrepreneurs, (laughs) you know? You, you've now transformed from that first dollar that you take in, you are now transformed into something new and magical. And how do other people cope? So, Marjorie, what was your ordinary beginning? Well, um, I actually had started a couple of other businesses that were fairly successful prior to getting into this one. Mm-hmm. And, but they, they, they both or all three or four, I, you know, I'm not a, I don't call myself a serial entrepreneur, but I've been very interested in busy business and money most of my life. They all had a fatal flaw and I'll get into what that fatal flaw is uh, in just a little bit further in the interview. Um, but I had been a money manager I had been a student of my first degree was in electrical engineering. And I went out as an expat with Motorola, uh, managing some cellular telephone networks based in Hong Kong. And while I was there, a guy named Robert Kiyosaki, long before he was famous for Rich Dad, Poor Dad, was teaching these classes on money. And I was really interested in money. And I took some of his classes. And um, long story short, he inspired me to learn how to have money make money instead of just making money. Right. So um, I also got the call to motherhood and uh, decided to the best place to raise a family and do this would be to move back to the United States. And I chose the Austin, Texas real estate market and built a very successful uh, real estate investment business based on Robert's principles, taking on partners and things like that. Um in fact, it was so successful. I was on Robert Kiyosaki's, both of his testimonial, uh, I was the lead testimonial in both of his infomercials with Time Life Books. I was on national television every night. <laughs> it's kind of funny. Friends call me up and go, I, was that you? I thought you were an engineer. I'm like, yeah, I'm making money now. You know, it's kind of a change. Anyway, um, If you're going to be making money, the secret to making a lot of money is OPM, and that's other people's money. And of course, I had brought on investors. We were structuring very high yield, limited partnerships, investing in real estate around uh, Austin. But our biggest partner was Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. 
uh, you know, for the funding, for the lending. And I thought, well, I should really look at their business model sometime, right? I mean, you know, and I really dug into it. And when I did, I was like, oh my God, uh, there's a problem here. Houston, <laughs> we got a problem. And um, also, you know, our side of the transactions were always clean, but in a real estate deal, you can often see the other side and we were seeing more and, and real estate's kind of a nasty business, let's face it. But we were seeing more and more and more outright fraud going on. It was like, I think it's time to get out of this. And what really did it for me though, because, you know, I mean, closing a completely successful business is a big decision and you just don't do that without some like, you know, freight train kind of deal. Right. So I was getting kind of concerned about things and I'm a young mother and I'm definitely interested in food and nutrition. And I was working, I was volunteering on a program to get locally grown food into the elementary school and uh, a whole bunch of uh, volunteers. And we were so excited because it's such a good idea, you know, get local farmers, provide local produce, well, that project completely failed. And I will never forget the night that it failed. I mean, I literally shook for hours and then had years of panic attacks and mental problems from this one night. And what it basically was, was we got to putting pen to paper to figure out who would be the farmers that would provide these vegetables. And living in the city, you always think, oh, there's food out there in the countryside somewhere. Well, the truth is, is there isn't. There were not enough farmers to provide even part of the vegetables for one elementary school. Wow. And, um, wow. And I, yeah, I knew there were only four days worth of food supply in the inventory, that it's all just in time trucking. Um, and there's nothing, there's no, there's no, Warehouse, you know, there's no, the, the, the federal government has sold off all the, the, the backups, you know, it's all gone, uh, you know, the Reagan era, they destroyed all the, all the, the, the governmental stores and I really, I couldn't stop shaking and uh, I knew, I knew that the economy was going to collapse and I knew that um, uh, I started doing a lot of research on what happens during economic collapse and yes, you had better learn to shoot a gun, personal defense, You'd better learn some home medicine. But the biggest thing all the collapse survivors talked about was being hungry. So I said, well, I'm going to learn to grow food and I'm going to teach other people to learn to grow food. And that's what I did. It was, it was the, you know, I, the universe was taking me screaming and kicking. <laughs> that was like, that was it. Literally, Shit. I like eating dinner, <laughs> right? <laughs> and breakfast, and lunch, and a few snacks. <laughs> Three are great a day, and two I'll be good with. You know, one I can live on, but you know, none is not good. <laughs> no, no. Wow, wow, what an amazing story to to go with. So, so that was kind of your beginning. <clears throat> excuse me, and your call to action. It was, yes. you know, imminent collapse. Let's, let's feed ourselves. Let's at least make sure that we can get through this, right? Mm -hmm. So besides the potential lack of food, <laughs> what were some of the big hairy monsters that you were playing well, with? Yeah, so... You know, I didn't have any background. In I grew up in a, in a suburb in North Miami. My parents were artists, creatives. You know, we, I didn't, I was not one of those lucky hippie kids who knew how to grow food or anything. You know, I didn't know anything. So I dove right into every, you know, like I'm one of those kind of obsessive. When I decide I want to do something, you know, every gardening course, every permaculture course, citizen forest, or, you know, uh, um, anything that related to food, food production, food preservation, hanging out with barefoot crazies in the national forest, because they eat skinny, they're running around living good. What are they eating, you know? Um, and of course, um, 2008 came. And I, for me, it was like a nightmare but they did, that was not the thing. They managed to kick the can down the road for what it turns out another decade. We are here now where it is, they, they have nothing left. This is, it's happening now, right? This is it. Like you need to grow food now. We managed to get through it. And thank God, because it gave me a, a decade or so 
to build the grow network. So anyway, I, I, I was learning and I finally figured a bunch of stuff out and then I started teaching and everybody said, oh, you got to make a video. So I made a video and, uh, and I put it up on a website and I didn't know it. But at that moment, it was when I became a digital marketer. <laughs> it's just, New just, career. <laughs> you put a video up on a website, doesn't mean it sells, you know, like... Now, we did have about a half a million illegal downloads because they used to have those torrent sites where people could download stuff and had counters. And I was shocked. I mean, to create a viral video on how to grow food in your backyard is pretty amazing. But really, you know, they um, anyway, I said, I'm going to make I knew I had enough to make a business out of this. And um, the fatal flaw in the other businesses that I had always created uh, was they were all dependent on me. And I wanted to create a business this time that would survive me. I wanted to create a hundred year company because the crisis we're going through now, this next decade to 2020 to 2030 will be the most intense decade for humanity ever. Like this is epic. And then there will take many decades for us to continue to reintegrate it. And I figure that the grow network needs to be in existence about a hundred years and then it'll be, it's, it'll, it'll be done. So I wanted to set everything in place and I'm, you know, I'm 58 now. I'm clearly not going to live to, you know, like 148 or something. Well, maybe I will, but I don't plan on doing that. (laughs) Why not? So, (laughs) you know, (laughs) yeah. um, Building a company, learning how to sell stuff. And then still I have this ethic of growing half of my own food I was homeschooling my kids at the time. Uh, you know, it's the classic story of anybody who's starting a business or running a business. You like how, I have no idea how I managed to get all that in there. I still don't know how I managed to do the amount of stuff that I do. I think it's just laser flo- focus. Um, you know, uh, like the family in the evenings, they would sit there and they'd watch some television series or something. And I would vicariously like, hang out with partly, I'm not really into television. Uh, but like there, there's no time for that really because like I had to get a bunch of stuff done and um, you know I'm spending a lot of quality time with the kids because I'm homeschooling I'm spending a lot of quality time with my husband and all that I just wasn't choosing any of that recreational uh, nonsense um, right. so you know definitely wasn't by the way I never did uh, social media uh, I never um, I'd always heard about um, who's the first uh, first self-made billionaire is um, Martha Stewart right? Never did any social media at a time when everybody was like, you have to be on social media. And I, I really always have had somewhat of an aversion to it. And it turns out it's kind of like the digital marketers that were professionals said it's sort of a sucker's game. There are some people who have built real big platforms on it, but it's really hard to actually convert and have it make money. Um, so I, and I now, of course, we all see what the social media platforms are about and you don't actually own your own customers on social right. media. Right. That ended up being a, a wise decision. Um, I would say some of the other real big hairy monsters in there was um, if you're going to build something like the company that I've built, a mission and purpose driven company, and if you're going to build any company really, you need to have a clear vision and you need to have something be really compelling. Uh, like, you know, I mean, maybe I'm a little megalomaniacal. I mean, stopping the destruction of the earth. I really don't honestly <laughs> think you do that, right? Like, you know, come on, right? You know, but it's what's in my heart, right? Yes. Commercial agriculture is so friggin' destructive. Um, it, and, and you can grow some of your own food and it takes the pressure off of that. You know, your own meat, you don't want to eat meat that has been raised in horrible, terrible, barbaric conditions because you're bringing that into your body. Right. Um, you know, so there's so much that you, and it's so simple. Uh, but, you know, and selling that for the last decade or so has been extraordinarily difficult because, you know, I mean, it's not weight loss. It's not instant gratification. It's right. not right. sex. It's growing you know, food. Which yeah, takes time. It take it's a slow process. It's talking about real health, but it's not real health that happens from a pill. It's real health that takes months or a year or two. Um, so it was a real challenge. I mean, we really had to focus on 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 sales and marketing and learn to do it in a very ethical way. Uh, you know, from the heart, and also building a team was a huge 
a problem and, and you have to have a team. You just absolutely have to because you can't do it all on your own or you will totally be frazzled. My hair would be out like this. Right. You know, <laughs> you had any left at all. <laughs> and initially it was so hard. Like, how do you get really good quality people and I don't even have enough money to pay them half time, right? Like that's, so I went, and then also how do you get really good people? And it took me a long time to develop a really good, hiring process and even then uh we we, you know getting really good people is hard one of the keys to that though is having a very clear and compelling vision so building the organization um it turns out just having one product is a very difficult business and i didn't want to have a bunch of well you have to do product development and you know one thing leading to another and then I, I didn't want to write a newsletter every week, and but you got to write it. You got to stay in touch with the people you right. sold to because it's easier to, to sell somebody a second thing than it is to sell them the first thing. And you know, just all these business principles and um, and and managing to still grow my own food, be a mom, be a wife, be involved in my community, and build a company. Um, managing time and 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 doing the best I can with all of that. And I I think I did it pretty well, Um, but it was definitely really stretched. (laughs) Yeah. So who were some of your allies and mentors? You mentioned Robert Kiyosaki um, as a, as a mentor early on. Um, Mm -hmm. Who, who else were some of your allies, mentors, guides, sidekicks? Yeah. So many, so many, Sue. I mean, really, if you aren't constantly devouring um, business books, you know, like I am so grateful for audible because I, you know, I can be doing other, like I can be shelling peas or something and listening to, uh, uh, the shoe dog, Philip Knight. What a journey, man. I could totally relate to that guy's journey on how he built Nike. You can listen and, you know, you can get the insight and wisdom from the world's best, both alive and dead, you know, and so, so many books, uh, a foundational piece for me. Uh oh. No, 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 no. You, you gotta stop. Go away. Go away. So sorry, Sue. Um, a foundational piece for me was an online uh, a school for entrepreneurs called the Business Finishing School, and it's a four-year online program. Twice a year, they have physical gatherings, which are a little bit suspended right now. Super cost-effective. This guy Rick is amazing. The real deal. MBAs are for people who want to uh, become managers for big corporations. This is a training for people who want to build successful, they're entrepreneurs and they want to build successful companies that they can either sell or walk away from at some point in time. Uh, And that's what I wanted. Super great information there, business finishing school. Another one was uh, Bradley Communications on, it was a year long program on how to pitch the media, how to handle the media, how to have a best selling book. Uh, how to make it to the top of the New York Times list. What does that take? Um, so many, so many marketers. I can't, uh, every famous marketer you've ever heard of. <laughs> <laughs> right. I've done their program. <laughs> I've done right. all their stuff, you know, and I will say at the end of the day, I love all their stuff. I really ended up having to, to come up with my own, but I needed to learn all their stuff. And I am, we have such a data-driven company now and it's so great, you know, like, I think this would be a great landing page, but I think this ought to be on it. Well, like split test it, you know, it just right. ends on it, right? And, uh, and I've been humbled so many times. Um, through split testing of like, I think this is great, you know, and then everybody else is like, (laughs) you know, right. Yep. So, 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 so many, so many, uh, so many wonderful, wonderful. And and then Sue, you, you have been really invaluable at times with uh, just like, Oh my God, what am I going to do with this decision? You know? And um, yeah. So, so many guides and mentors. um, It it just innumerable. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, well, you know, like you said, you cannot do it alone. Um, I'm, I'm really passionate about this. The collaboration, allies, joint ventures. Yeah. That's the name of the game. You know, bringing on interns or, or people that you can build from the ground up. Um, I can't tell you how many wise, advanced marketers or business owners have said, I'd rather hire somebody 
with enthusiasm than knowledge. I can't tell you how many times I've been sexed by somebody's credentials. And right. uh, over and over again, you got to go for the values. And for us, it ends up kind of being a simple little filter, or it used to be anyway, as we said, have, do you grow some of your own food? Yes. And you believe, you know, that immediately got rid of, um, <laughs> got rid of a lot of people. But the other thing is, is I found, you know, I'm so excited about my own business. I'm so enthusiastic. And, we, and we'd and we often have the mirror effect is that when people were around me, they were excited about the business and I would be seeing my own excitement reflected in them. Right. And I've learned, first of all, to mute my energy when I'm around them and then also to be hypersensitive to what's genuinely what they're bringing to the table and what is it that they're, you know, picking up off of me. So, so much to learn. I, I will also say uh, when I look behind me, thousands and thousands upon thousands of failures, thousands of them. I mean, really, I look behind me and I am just astonished that the organization is still going. Um, right. Just many classic fuck ups I mean, <laughs> but that but it's true you know you you it's like learning to walk you really? fall down you know and and actually i think somebody said you know walking is the process of falling and then catching yourself all the time and yeah. of course you trip of course anybody who thinks that going into business means that you're golden and never fail is ludicrous i mean they're a lunatic <laughs> It's just insane. People have some other, here's another little tangent we'll go off. So some, you know, uh, so sometimes uh, people would write in every now and then people go, hey, hey, you're selling too much stuff. And, uh, you know, why don't you become a nonprofit? And I'm like, well, yeah, I've got to sell stuff because, you know, the people that work for me, they, they kind of like to buy groceries and pay their mortgage. You know, it's a little thing, you know. Um, so I have to pay them. And they're like, why don't you become a nonprofit? And I'm like, they don't understand. Just because you become a nonprofit doesn't mean money magically comes to you. All it does is change who you're hustling to, right? And I would much rather have a valuable, something that's of value that people actually are willing to pay for in exchange uh, to, to fund. And if this thing isn't funded by people who are getting value from it, then I don't want to do it. So right. yeah, so interesting little side tangent there. Yeah, yeah, and and it doesn't mean that you can't have a nonprofit in parallel, but it doesn't mean that you have to change the company structure. I yeah, mean, and really, quite honestly, we are one of those companies that we are so mission and purpose driven. That's our number one thing, and we're very clearly aware we have to do sales, uh, but we do not let sales make the the primary decision. Right. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. So you have been jumping into the entrepreneurial pool <laughs> for a long time now. Can you cast your mind back to when you first were going, hey, I could, I could make money doing this. And think about what were the reactions when you first did that of the people who were around you who didn't have the same inspiration and drive to do what you did. So many, so many, Sue. And, and, you know, because gardening and growing food is such a humble, simple act, uh, I would say that has truly been uh, the story of my business so far is complete, complete under, under, underestimating what it is that has been built and what I'm building and the movement that I've created. And, and um, I feel like now, uh, I'm, I'm starting to be, you know, people are starting to go, oh my God, look at what she's got there, right? But, you know, even my son in the beginning is like, mama, you're just out in that dirt. Like you, this ain't, you know, you know or, or my husband, I'd said, hon, I'm going to have a New York Times bestselling book. And, you know, he was kind of like not saying anything, which means, you know, he was trying not to be unsupportive, but you could tell he was like, this is, He's nuts, right? This is the, if you can't say something nice, don't say something at all. Yeah, and <laughs> but the energetic is still, there might be reason yeah. for a little while ago. But, um, you know, I mean, just nobody, right? And, and, and you know, people go, oh, that's Marjorie, she's got a little gardening business. 
and I will tell you that we have the largest organization on earth dedicated to this mission. And we have a, a newsletter that comes out three times a week. We have a blog that gets uh, posts almost daily. We have a full store. We have an online academy with 23 certifications. Uh, we have a whole publicity um, uh, function. We have a whole group that manages social media. Um, you know, we have a group that works with corporate partners. Uh, we host uh, two summits a year, big major summits that are attended usually by about 100,000 people. Uh, you know, we have about a half a million people in the GROW network, uh, super active and engaged forums. Uh, and that has been very methodically planned and built out and structured. And it really is the largest organization on earth. And it's a service. Uh, it's a dedication because, again, this time that we're in now, right now, people are, you know, I mean, you've seen empty shelves, right? Everybody yeah, has yeah. now seen empty shelves and everybody is now aware of what, what I call thin inventory that. Yes. There's only one or two on the front, right? And you know, there's nothing back there, but they got right. enough to make it kind of look good. Or maybe there's only one or two brands where there used to be five. I mean, people are seeing the breakdown in the supply chain and it yep. is far worse then yeah. you can understand right now. And it it's not going to get fixed this year. It is going to get much, much worse over the coming years. And that's actually a really good thing. What we're seeing is a complete collapse of our food system, our medical system, our financial systems and our governmental systems. And it's gonna be unbelievably chaotic. And uh, this is what we've built this to serve for how is the fastest and the easiest and the quickest ways that people can get up to speed to being able to produce food for themselves, to take care of their own needs, you know, everything from when you've been gunshot to when you just have a little bruise or something. I, how do you take care of yourself right. with medicines, plants that are growing in your yard? So yeah, yeah. that's, that's I'll, I'll, say, I'll say that, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, we, we had had, we have a nice big backyard and we had said, okay, every year we'll get another um, box. We'll, we'll, we'll get another raised bed and put it in the backyard and because the soil out here is not that great. And, and this year we bought four. Yes. <laughs> it was yeah. like, we were gonna get one a year. Nope, we're getting four. We planted right. all of them this year. That's a good I'll tell you the satisfaction of having a salad where everything <laughs> in the salad is something that you grew mm -hmm. is amazing. Yeah, or getting to go by the, um, you know, the the section in the grocery store where the yeah. eggs are and going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're not quite there yet. Our CCNRs don't allow chickens in our area. Although I would love to have chickens and goats in our backyard. I mean, I think that would be just perfect. Uh, yeah. We just, we're just not allowed to have them where we are. Uh, but I think some of our neighbors have decided that CC and ours can go by the wayside. That, those rules <laughs> will disappear. I've heard some chickens. <laughs> oh, those rules are going to disappear here very, very quickly. Uh, they right. will, I promise you, they're, they're going to change. And, and then in another, just an inspiring thing, to, you know, 20 years ago in the city of Austin, it was kind of like chickens, you gotta be kidding. Is that Bubbaville? And, you know, one fellow in particular, Selwyn Pollitt, loved his birds. He only had three of them. But he went on this big campaign and even went into the city. And it's totally turned around now to where they have the Austin Funky Chicken Coop Tour. <laughs> the city of Austin offers free training to anybody who wants to have a flock of backyard chickens. And they will even subsidize you some amount of money to wow. build it. You know why? They found out that chicken owners will feed all of their food scraps to their chickens and it costs them That's much the less for the waste. And so it's an actual budget thing that by encouraging more chickens and giving away money to get people to grow, have chickens in their backyards, it's a cost benefit to them. Right. So, and I'm sure people are, chain, are uh, trading uh, chicken manure for other things. Yeah, I bet you. Just, just with what's coming. I mean, we've been through 2020. That was just minor compared to what's coming in 2021. And believe me, as people get more hungry, um, you know, those rules about having hens in your backyard are, are just going to be, you know, whoever's president of the Homeowners Association, if they're going to try and enforce that. It's I don't know. I'm used to living in Texas. We like to shoot people or threaten to shoot them anyway. So, you know. <laughs> uh, 
Probably not in Sonoma County, but maybe. Yeah. <laughs> we might be seeing more of it. <laughs> or more chickens, at least. More chickens. <laughs> so um, I have a, a sort of a surprise question for you, sure. Marjorie. What's your favorite part of all of what you do? What's the thing that if you get to do it, it just lights you up? It's, it's growing my own food, you know? Yeah. And, and I'm, I've been doing a series of interviews with um, business executives, bu business leaders. And these are people that are running budgets of, you know, hundred million dollars. They may have thousands of people reporting to them and they're growing their own food and every single one of them, they're doing it for the stress relief. Right. For sure. Enjoyment. And, um, you know, actually after I made that first video and started the website and I thought, well, that'd be great is then I can go right back into my yard and just do research, which I love. Right. But no, it demanded that I build this whole grow network thing, you know, and, um, and, <laughs> and I like, the, I've got a book coming out and I keep, I, I keep fantasizing that when the book comes out, I'm going to be able to just go back to doing, and I know that's not true. Once the book comes out, my whole life is going to change again. Right. And I will play a much bigger role on, on the, on the global stage toward, helping this whole transition but the the actually being out there with the rabbits and the chickens and, and the magic of growing and the production and eating delicious food and i mean that for me i have an ethic of growing at least or wild crafting at least half of my own food and i i am so glad that i made that and enforced uh that for myself the, i said the, you know towards the business side the team meetings mm -hmm. You know, I've built a, a, a team of A players and, and believe me, that was, that's huge. I think if there's any other accomplishment that I'm most proud of, it's the team. Nice. And uh, this, this group of people are amazing. They're all kind of weird in different ways. Um, and um, I, we try to get together at least once or twice a year and go somewhere really fun and we do a meeting, a planning meeting, but I always plan two days in there for just playing around. Right. And for me, that I live for those times because you know we've all worked so friggin' hard, right? And um, and they're just we've been together so many years now, and it, they're they're just like another family, and yeah. So yeah. the team meetings would be the other, the other real joy. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, this has been one of the most inspiring interviews, Marjorie. I have to say because you know growing your own food and not just growing your own food, but taking that as a worldwide movement is amazing. That's, yeah. that's just cool. <laughs> that's just amazingly cool. So thank you so much for being on the show. I really appreciate that you took the time to do this. And well, thank you for having me, Sue. I've, it's been fun. And yeah. uh, Really appreciate what you're doing. Yeah, thank and, you. And good luck with your book launch. Um, this episode will come out, I think, before your book comes out, but we'll try to push it back in. <laughs> we'll read the, 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 uh, the episode here to yeah. rerun re it in early May or something. Rerun it in early May, and we'll get this uh, book launch out for you. Thank so, you. Yeah, thank and you. I want to thank the viewers of The Sweet Sound of Success. Are your dreams for your business. You know what drives me crazy? Really smart business owners denying their talents because they've been taught it has to be hard, because they've been taught that they don't deserve their gifts, that they're not worth anything. They've been taught that their gender means they can't express their genius. 
I'm Sue Wilhite, and I want you to have access to your genius. I want you to go out and rock the world with your genius. So I created the Call to Action Coaching Program. It's all about getting to the heart of you and what you've got to share with the world to make a profitable business that thrives and allows you to make a difference in the world. Click the link to sign up for the Call to Action Coaching Program today. Don't let your genius go unnoticed.